My name is Emily Towns and I'm the Dean of Vanderbilt Divinity School and it is good to welcome you here and also those who are joining us on the VDS YouTube channel for the 2018 Cole Lectures. These lectures were established in 1893 by Colonel E.W. Cole of Nashville to bring lecturers to the campus in defense and advocacy of Christian religion. As we have now turned into the 21st century, we are broadening this once again to include engagement, conversation, and even shared deliberation that Christian traditions might share with other faith traditions. Among the distinguished church leaders and theologians who have delivered the Cole Lectures over the last 124 years are Harry Emerson Fostick, Paul Tillich, H. Richard Niebuhr, Fred Craddock, Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza, Albert J. Rabato, Gustavo Gutierrez, James Cohn, Don Beiswanger, Ed Farley, David Buttrick, Marcus Borg, Jurgen Moltmann, Peter Gomes, Jim Wallace, James, James Lawson, Elaine Pagels, Nikki Finney, Tex Sample, and Daisy Machado. It is my great honor to introduce our lecturer for this evening, the Reverend Dr. Gary J. Dorian. Professor Dorian is the Reinhold Niebuhr Professor of Social Ethics at Union Theological Seminary and Professor of Religion at Columbia University where he teaches social ethics, theology, and philosophy of religion. He, is pre he was previously the Parfit Distinguished Professor at Kalamazoo College, where he taught for 18 years and was the director of the Liberal Arts Colloquium. An Episcopal priest, he also served as Dean of Stetson Chapel at Kalamazoo. Professor Dorian is the author of 19 books and more than 300 articles that range across the fields of social ethics, philosophy, theology, political economics, social and political theory, religious history, cultural criticism, and intellectual history. When you hear that breadth and length, you think, well, it can't be very deep. Wrong. Gary is one of the social ethicists and theologians that I read on the regular to know what's going on and to watch the trends. In 2017, he won the Grawmeyer Award for his book, The New Abolition, W.E.B. Du Bois and the Black Social Gospel. In 2013, he won the Association of American Publishers Prose Award for his book, Kantian Reason and Hegelian Spirit by e Idealistic Logic of Modern Theology. In 2010, Dorian won the Choice Award for Social Ethics in the Making. A prolific writer who is always plowing new ground, his other recent books are Breaking White Supremacy, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Black Social Gospel, and Imagining Democratic Socialism, Political Theology, Marxism, and Social Democracy. Imagining Democratic Socialism will be released next month. In it, Dorian examines the intertwined history of social democracy, Marxism, and Christian socialism in Britain and Germany, making an argument for decentralized economic democracy. In recent years, Dorian has been the Horace D. Y. Lentz Visiting Professor at Harvard Divinity School and the Paul E. Rather Distinguished Pro Scholar at Trinity College. He lectures frequently in Germany, England, and Canada 
and writes for Cross Currents, American Theology, American Journal of Theology and Philosophy, Tikkun, Christian Century, Telos, Commonweal, and a few other jour journals. To my mind, Gary is one of the best of the best in social ethics and theology. His lecture topic for the first of two co-lectures is Stubborn Ethical Radicalism, Christian Socialism as Political Theology and Economic Democracy. I encourage those of you who are here to join us in the reading room just next door for a reception in Gary's honor after the talk. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Gary Dorian to the Divinity School and the University as we engage in vibrant conversation that begins tonight and continues tomorrow. Emily, thank you so much for that very generous and kind introduction. Uh, I am delighted to be here. I have greatly admired this school for many years, uh, especially in recent years under the leadership of Dean Emily Towns. Uh, this has long been an extraordinary faculty uh, that has gathered here, but uh, never more than uh, in this moment. I have many friends on this faculty, especially Victor Anderson, Ellen Armour, Juan Floyd Thomas, Stacy Floyd Thomas, Jörg Grieger, Melissa Snarr, and Dean Emily Towns, and uh, Laurel Schneider, who's just across the way uh, as well. I wrote a long chapter on the history of theology at Vanderbilt in my volume three uh, of liberal theology. So this school holds a special place in my heart and mind, and I'm delighted to be here. Democratic socialism is making a remarkable resurgence in this country. And my subject tonight is Christian socialism as a species of political theology, democratic socialism, and ethical radicalism. Christian socialism paved the way to every form of liberation theology that privileges the experience of oppressed and excluded communities. It created a far better form of political theology than the Carl Schmitt version that we supposedly invented political theology. It has a complex and important relationship with democratic socialism. It is stubbornly ethical. Today, it is needed as a liberationist and ecological form of economic democracy. And I will begin with how I came to write about such things many years ago. I have accepted belatedly in my career that I need to do this sort of thing early in a talk. <laughs> I grew up in a poor, semi-rural, nominally Catholic family in mid-Michigan, Bay County. My parents had come from Michigan's Upper Peninsula, where my father took abuse for his Cree heritage. When he looked in the mirror, he saw an inferior caste. So he moved to mid-Michigan to acquire passably white status. The most loving thing he could imagine doing as a parent was to claim for his children all the white privilege he could get. Today, my father is proudly, even aggressively, Native American. And I appreciate that he was able to reclaim his racial identity. It would never have happened without the Civil Rights Movement. But I am a child of the white working class. Having never experienced or claimed any other racial identity, and this nation has never had a breakthrough for racial justice that did not set off a mighty backlash from my group, we are certainly in one now. In my youth, I got to mass just enough to be caught by the figure of the crucified Jesus. This God figure who responded to evil with self-sacrificing love provided a religious ideal, 
a sign of transcendence that broke through my everyday horizon of lower class culture and the next game. Then the stunning witness of the civil rights movement similarly broke through, eventually melding in my thought and feeling with the cross of Christ. I came of age in the climactic years of the movement. My teachers described America as the world's greatest nation in every way that mattered and the greatest ever. But the civil rights movement taught a very different lesson. King became the formative figure for me long before I understood much of anything about politics or religion. Then he was assassinated, and he became a Jesus figure who died for us, the exemplar of the peacemaking and justice-making way of Jesus. That was the extent of my religious worldview when I squeaked into college. In my 20s and early 30s, I served as an organizer and public speaker for a Salvadoran solidarity organization, C-SPACE, and as an organizer, national board member, and chapter president and of two democratic socialist organizations, DSOC and DSA. Through all of it, I had King in my head and Norman Thomas, both of whom were mediated to me through my mentor and friend, Michael Harrington. Thomas was the leading American exponent of democratic socialism for 40 years and the six-time Socialist Party candidate for president. In my 20s, I absorbed Harrington's stories about his friendships with King and Thomas and his attempts to be faithful to what they cared about. Thomas worked tirelessly for racial justice, civil liberties, peace, and economic justice imploring Americans that a strong dose of European social democracy would be a very good thing for this country. In 1932, he ran on the usual socialist platform, sharing no positions with Democratic candidate Franklin Roosevelt. Then, Thomas watched Roosevelt carry out 90% of the socialist platform. Socialists got zero political credit for the New Deal as Thomas won fewer votes in 1936 than in 1932, despite being called the conscience of the nation. Thomas showed that a socialist could win respectability in American politics as long as one opposed communism and did not seem dangerous. He wore three-piece suits and sounded like the Princeton minister and former graduate that he was, <clears throat> Presbyterian minister. He dreamed of a farmer labor social democratic party modeled on the cooperative commonwealth in Canada, which morphed into the new Democrat party in 1961. King called Thomas the most courageous person he ever met. Thomas, however, never won more than 2.2% of the national vote, a far cry from what Eugene Debs had gotten previously. I was schooled in the bitter lessons of the Norman Thomas era by old left socialists who had lived through the humiliation and futility of the Thomas campaigns. In the 1970s and 80s, our organizations periodically raised the Norman Thomas question, which in our context meant, should we run Mike Harrington for president? If we didn't run Harrington for president, how are Americans to learn there is such a thing as democratic socialism? Harrington co-founded the organizations that succeeded the Socialist Party, DSOC and DSA. He persuaded them to work in the left wing of the Democratic Party, which he called the left wing of possibility. Every election season, many of us youthful types, having come of age in the civil rights and anti-war movements of the 60s, chafed at Harrington's strategy. Why should we join campaigns in which we were silenced? How did that move the needle toward economic democracy and universal Medicare? Always the old timers invoke the bitter lessons of the Norman Thomas era. Liberal victories clear room for social democratic gains. Now as then, there is no other way lacking an eruption that changes the lessons of history. In the USA, that was a plausible judgment. 
Then, a far more crippling version of No Other Way became the slogan of an entire era. When Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan said there is no alternative, Tina, they meant there is no alternative to letting finance capitalists and the corporations just do whatever they want. There is one market, and it is a jealous God. Today, we are witnessing a many-sided revulsion against what came of Tina. But here as elsewhere, there is no substitute for learning what happened before we got here. Because in this country, mere revulsion nearly always stampedes to the right. Every social democratic party in the world is a reminder of the 19th century dream of democratic socialism and a pale reflection of it. The dream was and is a fully democratized society in which the people control the economy and government. No group dominates any other, and every citizen is free, equal, and included. Today, social democratic parties throughout Europe are struggling to sustain the welfare states they built after World War II and to hold off reactionary movements based on nationalism, racism, and xenophobia. Economic globalization has battered the social contracts that social democracy constructed during its heyday. In some places, social democrats have lost the memory of what it even means to fight for economic democracy, and new organizations must be created. In other places, social democratic parties are worth saving. I have written about economic democracy for many years. And my next book is on the intertwined legacies of Christian socialism and social democratic politics in Britain and Germany, as you just heard. So this talk tonight is a bit of a preview before the book comes out. <clears throat> uh, it's actually a maiden voyage, so I don't actually know this lecture yet. <clears throat> in the 1820s, Charles Fourier and Robert Owen propounded the original idea of socialism in France and England. The idea was to achieve the unrealized demands of the French Revolution, which never reached the working class. Instead of pitting workers against each other, a cooperative mode of production and exchange would allow workers to work for each other, with each other. The original idea of socialism was to organize society as a cooperative community, period. Soon there were other kinds of socialism conceived by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon and Mikhail Bakunin, Karl Marx, Ferdinand LaSalle, Sidney Webb, Edward Bernstein, William Morris, Karl Kotsky, Rosa Luxemburg, V.I. Lenin, unfortunately, and G.D.H. Cole. These founders blamed capitalism for all of society's ills. But Christian socialists did not blame capitalism for everything. So there were Christian versions of every kind of socialism. Every kind of socialism retains the original idea of organizing society as a cooperative community. But there is no core that unites the many schools of socialism or even of democratic socialism. Democracy is as complex and variable as socialism. It excludes the communist traditions from the category of democratic socialism, but does not exclude certain communist thinkers, such as Rosa Luxemburg. I believe that the best candidate for an essential something in democratic socialism is the ethical passion for social justice and radical democratic community. This ethical impulse retains the original socialist idea in multiple forms, playing out in struggles for freedom, equality, recognition, and democratic commonwealth, conceiving democracy in terms of the character of relationships in a society, not mere voting rights. Some socialist traditions have denigrated moral anything as mere idealism, usually in favor of a collective determinist claim along Marxian or Fabian lines. But no definition of socialism as economic collectivism or state control of the economy or any particular ownership scheme is common to the many traditions of socialist thought. Historically, Marxism played the leading role in reducing, for a great many, the idea of socialism to collective ownership. 
Karl Marx thought that the structure of economic ownership determines the character of an entire society, and socialism is the collective ownership of the means of production, a sufficient condition for fulfilling the essential aspirations of human beings. He developed the most powerful and illuminating critique of the capitalist system ever conceived, inspiring numerous traditions of Marxian criticism. His focus on the factors of production and the structural capitalist tendency to generate crises of overproduction and crash made permanent contributions to political thought. His achievement was so great that even non-Marxian traditions of socialism must be understood in relationship to his thought. But Marx's dogmatic determinism, his catastrophe mentality, and his doctrine of proletarian dictatorship caused immense harm. He developed his theory during an era in which democracy was merely a form of government, and thus of very low importance to him. His denigration of moral everything obscured his own ethical wellspring. And his fixation on collective ownership wrongly identified socialism with a totalizing goal. Christian socialism has its richest tradition in England, even though England had hardly any great theologians or even any Marxists. <clears throat> British Christian socialism began in the late 1840s with Anglican theologian Friedrich Denison Morris and his activist comrade, John Ludlow. Morris argued that cooperation is the moral law of an already existing divine moral order. Socialism reflects the divine order by creating a cooperative society. Ideologically, the first Christian socialists were in the cooperative tradition of Robert Owen sometimes with a French inflection. In Anglican church politics, they were ecumenists who floated above the Protestant, Catholic, and broad church parties that just defined the Church of England. The first Christian socialists clashed with each other over consumer cooperatives, state financing for producer cooperatives, that's a huge one, and cooperative syndicates, fatefully. But Christian socialism was dramatically resurrected in the 1880s as a protest against a new phenomenon, massive structural unemployment. There were three major Anglican socialist organizations and three major ecumenical socialist organizations and a smattering of small denominational organizations. Christian socialism, however, was predominantly an Anglo-Catholic phenomenon that toiled in desperately poor areas and that quoted Morris and surged into Oxford and helped to create the Labor Party. Ideologically, there were different kinds of Christian socialism and even of Anglican socialism. Some of them were stubbornly cooperative in the Owen and Morris mode. Some joined the Fabian movement after it arose in 1884. Many joined the social union reformers who came out of Oxford. Some gave highest priority to socializing land, which is just a huge issue in the 1880s and 90s, coming out of the Henry George critique. A great many joined the Workers' Party movement after it arose in 1893, and some became leaders of the Guild Socialist movement that took off in 1912. But Christian socialism had an ethical wellspring that qualified its commitment to all these ideologies. Christian socialists were committed to an ethic of equality, freedom, and cooperative community. They denied that a Fabian or syndical or social unionist or Marxist ideology was more binding than their moral convictions. Very often, they were accused of being moralistic on this account, and much of the literature on this subject just follows suit. I am much more impressed by stubborn, ethical, socialist conviction, because in many, states, in many situations, as in this story, it's the only alternative to despair, or selling out, or giving up. Christian socialists and secular ethical socialists have a long history of working together in England that started with Owen and Ludlow and ran through two Victorian literary icons, John Ruskin and William Morris. 
Ruskin was an art critic, an Oxford Don, who wrote books imagining a cooperative society. Morris was a poet and novelist who founded the Socialist League in 1884 and wrote brilliant propaganda for it. He died in 1896, leaving a romantic legacy centered on novels in which people actually found happiness by building an egalitarian society. Britain had no workers' party until 1893, when Christian socialist labor leader Keir Hardy compelled socialists to make an excruciating choice. Should they stay in the radical wing of the Liberal Party or join the party of actual workers, the Independent Labor Party? Some preferred the middle class company of the, Labor Par of the Liberal Party, and many of them had a deeper, profound, important misgiving. A workers' party might be a disaster for anti-imperialism and anti-racism and it would surely destroy the radical wing of the Liberal Party. Even if the ILP could be swung to anti-imperialism, splitting the progressive vote would hand the government to the Tories, which is exactly what it did. Radical Christian socialists such as S.G. Hobson, Charles Marson, and Conrad Noel replied that staying in the Liberal Party was a ridiculous option for any socialist. You just have to face up to what the downside is. Now that a workers' party existed, Christian socialists had to join it and then try to convert it to anti-imperialism, anti-racism, and anti-militarism. Meanwhile, the Fabian Society became an activist powerhouse led by sociologist Sidney Webb, his partner Beatrice Webb, and literary star George Bernard Shaw. They said that Christian British socialism didn't need Marx's glorification of revolutionary violence or any of his exotic doctrines. All it needed was to proceed on its present course. The reach of government grew every year. This process was relentless, beneficial, and civilizing. It tamed the predatory impulses of capitalism, making society more and more rational. Soon, the flow of progress would surely civilize England and the entire world. All good liberals, progressives, ethical socialists, radical Democrats, and radical Tories of the late Victorian era believed that the world was progressing toward higher forms of civilization and democracy. Even Marxists believed that. The Fabians turned this belief into an argument for bureaucratic state collectivism. Socialism was government ownership directed by elite managers, that is, Fabians. But Christian socialists and ethical socialists fit their ideology to their moral convictions, not the other way around. Even those who joined the Fabian society fought for the ethical difference whenever it arose. It arose repeatedly over imperialism and racism. All Britons were schooled in the lore, the lore of the British Empire, a tale of mercantile colonization under the Stuarts and Cromwell, war victories against the Dutch and French and Spanish in the 17th century, the acquisition of Eastern North America, the St. Lawrence Basin in Canada, numerous territories in the Caribbean, slave trading outposts in Africa, commercial interests in India, and all that came of all these things up to Benjamin Disraeli's imperial incursions in the 1870s in Egypt, India, Afghanistan, and South Africa. Then came a new kind of imperialism that political economist John Hobson a radical liberal with close ties to ethical and Christian socialists was the first to name and describe. Classic anti-imperialists said that empire is a problem of power, lust, and military overreach that is cured by ethically decent politics. Tories were the bad party because they were shameless imperialists. Hobson said, that a new kind of imperialism emerged in the 1880s, one driven by fierce economic competition for new markets and the discovery of natural riches in Africa. He wrote about this historical turn as it occurred, publishing 10 books before he wrote his famous book, Imperialism, in 1902. 
He said that modern capitalism was unsustainable without exploiting colonized markets. He didn't say that economics explains everything. Hobson made moral arguments. He stressed that politics matters. He wrote about the psychology of jingoism. And he influenced Christian socialists who blasted the vicious plunder of Central Africa and, in 1898, the Boer War. Eminent Christian socialists such as Scott Holland and Charles Gore scathingly condemned British imperialism throughout their careers, as did Anglicans like Marson and Noel. They fought with Fabian leaders on these subjects because Sidney Webb, Beatrice Webb, and Shaw were terrible on colonialism, racism, the Boer War, and then even eugenics. The Webbs and Shaw said that Fabian socialism was compatible with various foreign policies, and it needed to prove its patriotism to British voters. So they got the Fabian Society to take no position on the Boer War. Meanwhile, they warned that Jews, the Irish, and the poor were outbreeding England's productive class, a terrible crisis for the United Kingdom and civilization itself. The ongoing battle between ethically-based socialists and the Fabian leaders mattered very much after the Labor Party was founded in 1906 and the Webbs joined it in 1914. Sidney Webb, in 1918, wrote the Constitution of the Labor Party, establishing its official ideology, which was pure Fabian socialism. Full employment and a living wage, common ownership of industry, progressive taxation, and surplus spending for the common good. Clause 4, demanding common ownership of the means of production, distribution, and exchange defined the party for 42 years, and formally for 35 years after that. Clause 4 did not say, and does not say, that socialization means nationalization, or that even that everything should be socialized. It was consistent with guild socialism, worker ownership, consumer cooperatives, municipal ownership, competitive public enterprises, and mixed forms of these models. But nationalization was popular in 1918 and demanded for the coal, line, for the coal mines and railways. To some, Nationalization was the preferred mode of socialization. To many, including Sidney Webb, it was the only one that mattered. In common usage, socialism from that time onward came to mean nationalization, notwithstanding that state socialism was the latecomer in the entire history of socialism outside Germany. The Labor Party grew powerful under its Christian socialist, Fabian, and ethical socialist leaders. Christian socialism played the leading role in creating the Labor Party, and then it played the leading role in keeping the bad parts of the Fabian tradition out of the Labor Party. Meanwhile, in Germany, Social Democrats battled from the beginning over Marxism and the role of the state. Young Karl Marx was a radical humanist who spent his early intellectual career thrashing out his relationship to Hegel. Then he stepped into history in 1848 as the author of the Communist Manifesto. Capitalism, he said, stands for the rule of human products over human communities. It gains power, grows out of control, constrains human expectations, and blights the lives of the many. Communism is precisely the abolition of capitalist tyranny and liberation from it. The manifesto was shot through with motivational language, and it came at the outset of Marx's ultra-left phase, which lasted about two and a half years. <clears throat> Thus, it conveyed only one side of his complex, scholarly, radically democratic vision with fateful consequences. Marx said the bourgeoisie of middle-class business owners and professionals was corrupt, hostile to workers, and dying, but proletarians should help bring it to power nonetheless. Once the bourgeois revolution took place, the proletarian revolution would sweep it aside, apparently with no intervening period of bourgeois government instituting what he called the dictatorship of the proletariat. Every part 
of this catastrophe vision of deliverance was rife with danger. Yielding fateful debates about revolutionary violence, proletarian dictatorship, vanguard centralism, and anarchist expectations. To Marx, a communist state was a contradiction in terms, but he fought with anarchists over the enormous difference between vowing to abolish the state, anarchism, and believing the state would die out after the revolution, Marxism. Meanwhile, Marx tried not to fight with his own first disciples, German socialists who accepted only the parts of Marxism that they liked or dubiously understood. Ferdinand Lassalle was the first and foremost German proto-Marxist. He was brilliant, eccentric, Jewish, a democratic socialist, and above all, Prussian. He embraced much of Marx's critique of capitalism, but not his vision of revolutionary deliverance. In 1863, LaSalle founded Germany's first socialist party, the German Workers' Association. He taught that the road to socialism was legal, democratic, and parliamentary. It relied on the organized power of human will, not Marxist inevitable laws of history. Socialism is democracy realized, and the state has a vital role to play in it, especially in Germany. LaSalle colluded secretly with Prussian President Otto von Bismarck over their aversion to liberals and their dream of a united German empire. He called for state financed producer cooperatives and played up his affinities with Marx, who struggled to be cordial to him. LaSalle's vanity was hard to take, and Marx resented that LaSalle helped himself to Marx's ideas selectively. But Karl Marx was in no position to antagonize the founder of German socialism. LaSalle had a mutually respectful relationship with Wilhelm von Kettler, the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Mainz. Briefly, there was a chance that German social democracy and the Catholic hierarchy might achieve a decent working relationship. But LaSalle got himself killed in a duel over romantic entanglement, and the chance was lost. <clears throat> In 1869, Wilhelm Liebknecht and August Babel founded another socialist party, the Social Democratic Workers' Party. Now there were two social democratic parties in Germany. Each of them claimed to be redder than the other, and each blasted the other for selling out Marxism. Each wore its hostility to religion as a badge of honor and grew impressively. Both parties won breakthrough vote tallies in 1874, but they split the socialist vote, which compelled bitter antagonists to merge in 1875. Both parties were less Marxist than they claimed, and both had radical democratic leaders with socialist tendencies. The chief cause of their rivalry was pro-Prussia versus anti-Prussia, not Marxist doctrine. The United Party's very basis of existence was at stake at the merger conference at Gotha. Karl Marx weighed in, blasting both parties famously for ignoring his economic formulations. The German Social Democrats went on to establish the gold standard socialist party in Europe, the Social Democratic Party, SPD heroically enduring government repression and a hostile Protestant establishment that denounced social democracy as anti-German, anti-God, anti-civilization, too Jewish, and too Marxist. Karl Kotsky, Rosa Luxemburg, and Edward Bernstein played major roles in this story. Kotsky defined what came to be called Orthodox Marxism. Luxembourg, a spectacular figure, brilliantly defended a possibility that was not to be, a freedom-loving revolutionary Marxism. Bernstein astutely identified the aspects of Marxism that were very problematic for democratic socialism. He showed that the ethical socialist and unionist factions of social democracy had a real basis in socialist theory. Socialists needed to grasp that capitalist economies are much more complex than Marx said. 
control of the economy was not inevitably destined to fall into the hands of a few monopolistic firms, and the growth of political democracy in the 19th century had to be taken seriously. Socialism is democracy in the economic realm, and democracy is the road to socializing the economy, not the other way around. Then, Bernstein played a mostly exemplary role before and after the great tragedy of German socialism, World War I. He railed against the anti-French and anti-British fear-mongering that paved the way to war. He wanted to believe that socialism was the antidote to capitalist wars. Shortly before the war began, he began to say, after the war began, he began to say that Germany was chiefly responsible for causing it. Bernstein and his center-left allies tried to stop the war without opposing the government, but that was impossible in every way. His anti-war faction was expelled from the Reichstag, and they regrouped as a new party, the Independent Social Democratic Party, USPD. Afterward, during the German Revolution of December 1918, Bernstein tried to unite the SPD and USPD. Another hopeless impossibility, and equally fateful. In 1920, the USPD joined the Communist International, shattering Bernstein's dream of what should have been. Bernstein saw the demon coming in his beloved nation before it fell for hypernationalism and stab-in-the-back mythology. He inveighed against Germany's refusal to accept responsibility for the war, which made him a pariah in his own party, the SPD, albeit with a seat in the Reichstag. Today, Edward Bernstein is revered as the founder of democratic socialism. But when he died in 1932, he was scorned in Germany as completely irrelevant and discredited. In the 1920s, a post-war generation of more or less orthodox Marxists revived Marxian theory by taking for granted some of Bernstein's criticisms. Gerd Lukács, Karl Korsch, Antonio Gramsci, Friedrich Pollock, and Max Horkheimer relinquished just enough of Kotsky's orthodoxy to reopen the debate about what is essential to Marxism. All felt the necessity of rethinking Marxist theory. Paul Tillich entered the story at this juncture. He was in the process of shucking off German militarism and nationalism, having served as a chaplain in World War I. Tillich had missed Christian socialism during his seminary training, not that it mattered, because German Christian socialism was nationalistic and militaristic, with precious few exceptions. Here, the ironies are cruel and tragic. Nearly all the great modern theologians were German. The greatest socialist movement was German, and the greatest socialist theorists were German. Yet German Christian socialism was late, flawed, and then toxically flawed. The coming of a proletarian movement in Germany terrified officials of the Lutheran Reformed, Lutheran Reformed Union, and Catholic churches. The German Protestant churches, the world of the working class, was just a foreign country. And the Catholic working class had to create its own party, the Center Party, to be involved in politics. Catholics were squeezed between a hostile social democracy and hostile state governments, especially in Prussia. The two leading German Christian socialists of the social gospel era were Adolf Stucker and Friedrich Naumann. Stucker built up a following by attacking social democracy, but then he noticed that nothing revved up his crowds like a run of Jew bashing. So he spent his later career warning that social democracy was very Jewish. Nauman was smoother and more intellectual, building a middle class following for a mildly progressive social gospel until 1903, when he became a flaming militarist and imperialist. Nauman perfected the aggrieved tone and feeling of a new, newfangled genre, national existentialism. Our enemies are surrounding us. They're out to get us. 
we must defeat them. Even the SPD had a right flank that touted German superiority and cheered for war after the nation went to war in August 1914. Germany had a trickle of progressive Christian socialists before, during, and after World War I. In September 1919, they organized a conference in Tombach to regroup. But there were never enough of them to rectify a failed beginning. Karl Barth at Tombach famously ridiculed the very idea of a social gospel. Never mind that politically he was still a social democrat. Bart was Swiss, but trained in German theology and identified with it. His powerful rendering of a neo-reformation approach to theology stoked an explosion of dialectical theologies that overtook continental theology. German liberal theology, as represented by the dominant richly in school, underwrote the civil religion of the German state, culture of Protestantism. Bartian crisis theology was about the sovereignty and wrath of a holy other god. Bart and Tillich developed profoundly different theologies of democratic socialist decency and transformation. Today, a great many theologians and religion scholars are somehow content to say that political theology began with the Nazi legal theorist, Carl Schmitt, who despised liberal democracy in standard Nazi fashion. Schmidt taught, cynically but interestingly, that the distinction between friends and enemies is the key to politics. He reasoned provocatively that all forms of political thinking are ways of renaming theological categories. His scholarly bandwagon, which got rolling in the political theologies of the 1960s, it sprawled to multiple fields in the 1980s, and is now a cottage industry, gave theologians an opening to reverse his program. All theology is political, especially when it claims otherwise. This reverse Schmidt procedure undergirds an enormous amount of creative work in contemporary religious thought. It tracks the displacement of God by the sovereignty of the modern state, which in some renderings gave way to the godly sovereignty of corporate neo-capitalism and colonialism, capitalist empire. It importantly counters the enlightenment rationalist isolation of politics from theology, which uprooted transcendence from the materiality of life. But Christian socialists were doing explicit political theology long before Schmidt, Immanuel Hirsch, and Paul Althaus championed the atrocious idea of fascist theology. Movements for Christian socialism arose in every nation that had a social democratic party. Christian socialism was a creative response to the social ravages of capitalism and usually imperialism. It pressed a fundamental question that no liberation or ecological movement can afford to brush aside. How can we build a political economy that is geared to the common good? Yet a great deal of contemporary religious thought precedes as though Christian socialism never happened and Carl Schmitt invented political theology. <clears throat> Every theologian has limitations and blind spots. <clears throat> I do not have a model socialist theologian. <clears throat> and my usual procedure is to get my favorites into a conversation, beginning with Leonard Ragos, Reverdy Ransom, and Walter Rauschenbusch, early founders. <clears throat> but time is pressing, <clears throat> and I will finish by explaining why Tillich is always important to me, including what he got wrong. Tillich grappled more creatively than anybody with the story that I have just recounted. And his failings are as telling as what he got right. He never forgot how he began. As a traumatized militarist staggering into the new world of 1919, Tillich was raised to regard the Social Democratic Party as a criminal enterprise. He had no experience of the working class whatsoever until he spent four years in the unspeakably brutal trenches of World War I in Northeast France. 
He conducted mass funerals and had two nervous breakdowns, begging to be relieved of his duties, which did not happen. The war burned a hole in his psyche that showed for the rest of his life. He vowed that the only kind of theology that deserved to be written had to address the abyss in existence that the war exposed. After the war, he hung out at cafes and started reading about socialism. He gathered a group of Christians and Jews to imagine a new kind of religious socialism, interfaith, devoted to cultural criticism, affirming what was true in Marxism, and discarding what was false in it. He developed an argument that the true parts of Marxism are the primacy of the proletarian struggle, the critique of commodity fetishism, the suspicion of ideological taint and bourgeois thought, the unmasking of ideological distortion, and the condemnation of exploitation and oppression. He took no interest whatsoever in the labor theory of value, which is probably just as well since Marx was half wrong about that, and the problems with it are just confusing consuming and then paralyzing. In 1928, his band of religious socialists gathered for a conference near Heidelberg. Ethical socialist writer Henrik de Mann, very popular at the time, urged the group to repudiate Marxism altogether, discarding the albatross of materialism, determinism, and atheism. Tillich said that this seemingly attractive position lacked something indispensable, Marxian dialectic. Did the religious socialists see the coming of the Gestalt and the seething tensions of the proletarian situation? Did they believe that a new social order is struggling to emerge in the movement of oppressed workers? That is Marxian dialectic something better than non-dialectical morality and better than vulgar Marxism. The following year, Tillich put it bluntly, arguing that Marxism is firstly a reality and only secondarily an idea. What is real is the emergence of the oppressed from subjection. This breakthrough of consciousness outstrips every rendering of it. Marxism is an idea, whatever it is, and it's much less important than the Marxian reality. Tillich felt the ambiguity of his situation before he suddenly lost everything that mattered to him. If religious socialism was true, and it was the basis of his whole, all of his work, then why was he so isolated in it? His monthly journal had 3,000 subscribers. Not bad, but a very select group. Was he wasting his time hanging on to liberal Protestantism? In 1931, he said that Protestantism is only Protestant when it transcends its confessional status. Protestantism and socialism could have developed differently, so the enmity between them was not inevitable. However, to the extent that socialism expressed the proletarian situation, it challenges Protestantism to discover its true nature in what he famously called the Protestant principle. The creative power of criticism expressing the relation between the unconditioned and the conditioned. The power that grasps us in the state of faith is not a God object, a God out there, a supreme being. It is the power that points us to the infinite and inexhaustible depth of our being, criticizing every form of religious pride and secular self-sufficiency. It says that the human situation is basically distorted because human beings arrogantly make gods of themselves, their desires, and their products, as Karl Marx explained more brilliantly than anyone. Human beings are unities of body and soul, but this biblical truism had become so alien to the churches that they had to learn it from the socialist movement. Tillich appreciated that liberal Protestantism respected science and modern criticism, and it espoused a humanistic ideal of personality. But the liberal Protestant emphasis on individual reason and morality yielded little self-criticism of its idolatrous elements. Schleiermacher's religion of consciousness is edifying only to middle-class churchgoers. 
Liberal Protestantism had no chance whatsoever of fusing with the oppressed as long as it identified religious feeling entirely with the sphere of consciousness. Tillich judged that depth psychology was like socialism in recovering lost worlds of meaning and vitality. It was no coincidence that psychoanalysis spread in the same Protestant nations that suffered massive breakdowns of the conscious personality through war, trauma, loss, and destruction. Religion has to get to the subconscious basis of desires and choices. Liberal Protestantism was just too rationalistic and isolated to be willing to do it. When Tillich moved to Frankfurt in 1929, he joined the Institute for Social Research, where Horkheimer taught that Marxism is a tradition of social criticism needing to be saved from orthodox Marxists. Tillich implored the Frankfurt Marxists not to repress religious questions, for socialism is the self-expression of the oppressed, providing a language of meaning, and meaning is ultimately religious, pointing to the unconditioned that transcends any specific context. A person's religion is whatever concerns her ultimately. Nobody fights for justice, lacking faith and ultimate concerns. He spoke insistently as a theologian, contending that socialism cannot be comprehended without its religious dimension, which is precisely why Paul Tillich does not get his due in books on the Frankfurt School. These books are written by people who don't want theologians in there. <clears throat> in 1932, he wrote The Socialist Decision, hoping it was not too late to hold off the Nazis. Tillich acknowledged that religious socialists had a hard time convincing socialists to give up their anti-religious animus. In Germany, the early socialists allied with the bourgeois parties that opposed the state church, and they believed that scientific socialism abolished just the need for religion. Then the bourgeois parties made their peace with religion, but the socialist movement never did. That had to stop. When Tillich spoke to church audiences, one objection far outstripped all the others. Marxism is deterministic materialism. He acknowledged, he always acknowledged, that Marxian orthodoxy is very problematic on this issue and that Marx contributed mightily to the problem. Orthodox Marxism denigrates all ideas, artistic and literary creations, spiritual values, moral intuitions, and love and feeling itself as superstructural rationalizations of economic interests. It interprets Marx's teaching that spirit is causally dependent on economics. But spirit is not a thing, and neither is economics. Economics is infinitely complex and multifaceted, involving the direction and quality of needs, modes of production and social relationships, scales of enterprise, virtually every aspect of human being. Economics cannot be isolated and made the cause of something intrinsic to it, spirit. In fact, neither is spirit itself anything in itself. Spirit is always the spirit of something. Marx understood the connection between being and consciousness because Marx was steeped in Hegel. Marx took from Hegel that the unity of being and consciousness is lost when being is conceived as a discrete cause from that which spirit follows as a discrete effect. Tillich never tired of saying that there, just, there is no such being or spirit. Human being is a twofold unity of being and consciousness, which doesn't mean there is no false consciousness. However one sorts out the conflicting things that Marx said about ideology, this subject is just a minefield unto itself, the idea of false consciousness makes sense only in connection with the idea of a true consciousness. False consciousness willfully thwarts the movement toward liberation. Religious false consciousness is false for being reactionary, not for being religious. The religion issue exemplified that socialism needed new answers. Tillich stressed 
that liberalism played the leading role in dissolving the communal bonds to land, social rank, ethnicity, race, religion, and patriarchy. But social democracy carried out the liberal attack on privilege and inequality, applying it to class rule. Thus, socialism is the greatest ally of liberalism and its greatest enemy a contradiction that has impaled every social democratic party. Socialists could not compete with right-wing appeals to the bonds of soil, race, memory, and nation, and they had no substitute for the liberal belief that unfettered capitalism creates social harmony and prosperity. So, was there nothing that social democrats could do to change this political disadvantage? On the one hand, they got clobbered constantly on the patriotism issue. On the other hand, they carried out the liberal agenda without believing in liberalism. Tillich made a head fake on liberalism and a perilous claim about patriotism. At the level of ideality, he said, socialists have to be internationalists. Socialism carries out the liberal idea that the national interest is subordinate to international law and the rights of humanity. But meanwhile, in the real world, socialism cannot be realized apart from national powers of origin. He claimed that the SPD ignored for too long the loyalty it owed to the German state. To suggest that social democrats flunked the patriotism test before 1914, or during the war, or in 1919, or in the 1920s, was dangerous and wrong. But Tillich went there anyway because he's grasping at straws in an utterly desperate situation. He could have faulted the SPD for exalting its partisan self-interest above the cause of democracy, but he opted for a larger concession. German social democracy, he said, belatedly learned that the concrete community of place, race, and culture always prevails over abstract appeals to transnational solidarity. Democratic socialism cannot be actualized if it does not actualize itself nationally. Socialists never believed in the free market rationale for liberal internationalism, and in 1932, that rationale lay in ruins. Dissolving the bonds of origin did not lead to a united humanity. It led to permanent economic warfare, and then wars of empire. Tillich said that socialists had to accept the nation as a power of origin, much as it killed them to do so. They had to accept that the nation is the most important and powerful weapon of domination ever placed in the hands of capital. Socialism must be internationalist in opposition to national imperialism and nationalist in opposition to the idea of international citizenship. He commended the SPD for putting the nation first in the German Revolution, the Civil War, the battle against inflation, and then the coal industry battle against France. These patriotic policies tore the party apart in the 1920s and very nearly destroyed it. He bitterly noted that right-wing parties never demonstrated similar self-denial for the nation. Their demagoguery on this point, he said, quote, is demonic in the most negative sense of the word, unquote. Well, that was enough to get him fired as soon as the Nazis took over. Tillich fled to the United States, where he did not want to go. His American career has no parallel whatsoever in modern religious thought. He achieved spectacular success in a nation lacking in intellectual culture by his standards, and in which he was in exile. He never learned much about American theology or politics. He never felt comfortable at Union Seminary, and he fretted for years that he could not write his system outside Germany. He attained fame far beyond anything that was possible anywhere else, 
aided by American friends who published collections of his essays, transcribed his classroom lectures into the three-volume systematic theology, and put his needs above their own. The crowning irony of his American career was that his system had to be translated into German. The later Tillich replaced religious socialism with depth psychology without actually dropping religious socialism. It annoyed him when friends or editors said he used to be a religious socialist. In 1949, he wrote an autobiographical article for the Christian Century that the editors titled, Beyond Religious Socialism. Tillich hated the title, protesting that there is nothing beyond religious socialism. Even his view of Marx had not changed. Hard as that was to say at the height of McCarthyism, Tillich still admired the prophetic, humanistic, and realistic elements in Marx's style and thought, and he still rejected the calculating, materialistic, and resentful elements in Marx's analysis. The Cold War, he said, snuffed out his guilty feeling that he should involve himself in political issues. It created a bipolar world that crushed any possibility of a third way between capitalism and communism, and thus it just made politics itself small and depressing. The tragedy of the fascist catastrophe gave way to the tragedy of Cold War dualism. Quote, and so I lost the inspiration for and the contact with active politics. Unquote. That failed the test of what he called the courage to be, as he very well knew. Tillich's closest friends, Wilhelm Pauk and James Luther Adams, told stories about Tillich avoiding issues and entanglements that could have gotten messy. Pauk said that Tillich had an extreme case of career ambition. Adams said that Tillich folded on the Cold War and on racial justice because he didn't want him to lose his enormous American audience. Tillich's religious socialism was still there in his luminous book on love, power, and justice, and in the third volume of his systematic theology, but he concealed it with vaguely depoliticized euphemisms. When pressed on this subject, he would say that the Cold War was just a colossal void the opposite of the Kairos moment of the early 1920s when new things were possible. Tillich had plenty of company in believing that ethical socialism is pointless and that Marxism works better without Marx's utopianism. His unfounded optimism on the second point played a huge role in getting the first point wrong. He rightly perceived that Marx's utopianism was the key to almost everything he got wrong about the imminent collapse of capitalism, the inevitability of proletarian revolution, and the anarcho-syndical paradise of the future. Thus, he stripped Marxism of its utopian expectation and dogmatism, but utopianism and dogmatism were not mere husks for Karl Marx. Marx's revolutionary expectation took the place of God, ethical truth, anthropology, the state, and ordinary politics. Believing in the inevitability of the revolution and its utopian promise relieved Marx of needing to bother with messy anthropological and political questions, let alone religious questions. Tillich rationalized that Marx preserved the creative meaning of Hegel's dialectic. Thus, his unfortunate eschatology could be just lopped off. But Marx did not preserve Hegel's obsession with the divine and human spirit of freedom. According to Marx, overthrowing the capitalist system of production and exchange would somehow transform everything and everybody. This somehow contained no miracle, as Tillich called it. To Marx, it was as inevitable and materially determined as the, as the very self-destruction of capitalism. I have the same regret about the role of Marxism in the thought of Tillich and of Reinhold Niebuhr. 
Both of them used it as an excuse to opt out of solidarity movements and then to bask in the applause of the American empire. First, they burdened Christian socialism with Marxist requirements and expectations. Then they had an excuse to drop Christian socialism, that's Niebuhr, or do nothing for it, Tillich. Both theologians defended the American empire whenever it had an interest at stake in the so-called third world, and both of them were utterly scathing in ridiculing ethical socialists who battled for what they called lost causes. In the United States, the figures that pulled the ecumenical movement into global solidarity struggles for social justice were Christian socialists who battled for lost causes. Mordecai Johnson, Benjamin Mays, Howard Thurman, Polly Murray, Miles Horton, Walter Mulder, Diane Nash, Martin Luther King Jr. It's the left wing of the black social gospel and its white allies. Even John Bennett moved in this direction after ecumenism took a post-colonial turn in the late 1960s. Those who stuck with social gospel radicalism did not believe that their willingness to kill for America was a litmus test of their political seriousness. Neither did they believe that struggles for justice are optional depending on their success. Quitting the struggle was just not an option for them. And thus, it was not considered. Tomorrow morning, I will begin with them. And they will take us into our time and context. Thank you, friends. Gary, once again, you have shown us just how encyclopedic your knowledge is. And there is much we can um, talk about, but because we have food next door, <laughs> we are going to hold the Q&A until tomorrow, after tomorrow morning's lecture. That said, something that we do is that we frame the, um, the poster and we will send it to you. You do not have to try and get this back to New York. But this is the poster that for the lectureship and it is our gift to you. Emily, thank you. That is beautiful. I love it. It's one of the greatest ones of, of its type I've, I've ever seen and to have it framed. It's a treasure. Thank you. I invite you to join us next door. <laughs>